Professor Emilio Zamora is a full professor of history at the University of Texas at Austin. He writes and teaches on the history of Mexicans in the United States, Texas, and all history, and focuses on the transnational Mexican community of the 20th century. Zamora has prepared for and collaborated production of 10 monographs, three single authored books, a translated, edited uh, World War II diary, World War I diary, three co-edited anthologies, co-edited ebook, and two Texas history uh, texts. It received seven Best Book Awards, a Best Article Prize, and a Fulbright Garcia Robles Fellowship. Zamora has earned at least uh, 20 additional recognitions, honors, and awards for his scholarly and community engagement work. He is a lifetime member of the Texas Institute of Letters, a lifetime fellow with the Texas State Historical Association, a member of the Texas Board of the Texas State Historical Association, and past president of that association. Okay, Dr. Zamora, please. Thank you very much, uh, Ricardo and welcome all our viewers out there. Um, it's a pleasure and an honor to be here presenting to you uh, some of my work as a historian. I'll start by saying that in history, we have a, a method that we often use. And the method basically involves uh, focusing on a historical figure, a historical event or an organization to illustrate larger trends over time. Um, obviously, when we focus, we, we, don't, we aren't able to provide a full account of these larger trends or themes in history. One of the um, important trends in history, uh, particularly in Texas and in Mexican American history, is that uh, we, that those of us that do work on the border and on the relations between Mexico and the U.S. are helping to internationalize U.S. history. This is an important uh, trend in the field of history. And I like to think that my presentation contributes uh, to that. The subject of my talk is um, an event that occurred between 1921 in 1923. The event involves a campaign, mostly in the state of Texas, led primarily by Mr. Ignacio Lozano. And we can have, we have a, an image of him uh, beamed up um, for, so you can see him. He was the editor of La Prensa between 1913 and roughly 1955. He then opened, along with his wife and other family members, La Opinion in California. In 1921 through 1923, he led a campaign to raise money to build schools in Dolores Hidalgo. Now, this is really signif significant, uh, in part because um, he is raising the necessary funds to build a school in the cradle of Mexican independence um, in Dolores Hidalgo, in the middle of the country. And he's doing it by raising money primarily with poor uh, immigrants and Mexican Americans who are not very far removed from an immigrant experience, maybe second, third, or fourth generation folks. So that's the subject, and I'll talk about that uh, important campaign. Um, what, what does it illustrate? Well, for me, in the field of history, it allows us to argue that Mexican American history or Texas history internationalizes US history. That is, it gives us a wider perspective, a better sense of proportion in our understanding of US history. It allows us to see U.S. history in, the, in an international context. It does make a difference, as most of you know. Um, the other important theme or trend over time that I think the campaign illustrates or help us better understand is the relationship between Mexican communities in places like Texas with Mexican communities in Mexico, as well as with the Mexican government. 
when we talk about relations that cross the border, we almost always talk about diplomatic relations. I'm talking about a different set of relations that involve non-governmental organizations, for example. But there's also relations between communities uh, that traverse that relations that traverse the international border. Um, that uh, relationship uh, continues into our present. There's been a rhythm in that history, an up and down motion. There's been moments when the relationships between communities across the border have been intense. There's moments in history when they've diminished in importance, like during the COVID period that we're now in. I think there's a, um, a low point in the relationship, but the relationship continues. And I think it's very important to understand that Texas, the U.S., does not sit in isolation of the rest of the world. And that the Mexican-American community and now the larger Latino community serves as a connection between these societies and governments. All right, let's turn to the subject. The subject is that campaign. Um, the campaign involved solicitations of funds by Mr. Ignacio Lozano through La Prensa, his daily newspaper from San Antonio. Organizations, individuals, churches, a number of uh, individuals and organizations participated in this campaign. Uh, Lozano was very astute. He encouraged people to contribute to the fund, to the campaign, by arguing, by basically using what I call the politics of longing among immigrants. A lot of these folks that had just arrived or two or three times removed identify with Mexico to the point that some of, the, some of them even uh, long to return to Mexico. Uh, let me just pause a minute here to underscore the importance of that longing element in the immigrant community psychology. There are two important novels that uh, all of us should be um, acquainted with, with. One of them is by Conrado Espinosa. He wrote El Sol, a very interesting novel about uh, a cotton picking family. And then there's also another novel by Teodoro Torres, La Patria Perdida, The Lost uh, Nation. The major theme in both of these novels is that longing to return and the discovery that you can never go home because home changes and you yourself change. Consequently, many of these immigrants and their descendants made the decision to remain here reluctantly with hope, but also reluctantly because they were severing in some ways relations with Latin America. That longing over time contributes to visitations across the border. It, it involves support for campaigns like the one Lozano led. It involves all kinds of other cases of in, uh, relationships across the border, including media, um, so that that longing remains in our time and contributes to those that that the permanency of that relationship, again, depending on the period. So in 1921, uh, Mr. Lozano uh, visited um, the new president of Mexico after with the revolution. The revolution has, uh, lasted for about 10 years. It devastated the country. The, the presidents that came in beginning in 1920, particularly Obregón, uh, were very interested in reconstructing the period. Mexico entered a period of reconstruction. One of the people that was recruited into the administration was a fellow by the name of Jose Vasconcelos, a major philosopher um, from Mexico. He headed the campaign to renovate the educational system. Schools had been destroyed, teachers had been killed, curriculum had been lost. So the idea was to rebuild the educational system 
the education of the youth represents the hope of the future in Mexico. So he initiates this project. Lozano immediately understood, saw the opportunity to insert himself as well as the community that he represented into this larger process of renovating Mexico. That takes a lot of astuteness and also took, it also required to make use of existing relations with the political elite in Mexico, including the president and Jose Vasconcelos. He met with them and then came back to San Antonio and no one knew until he spoke in Seguin, Texas in 1921, what he had arranged with the new president and Jose Vasconcelos. Um, he was invited to go and speak at the installation of uh, an, an organization Honorifica, which was a civic organization. These were civic organizations uh, connected to the Mexican consulate offices. Typically, the, the keynote address would be given by a consul, a, a head of a consulate office in the area and meant the, the head of the consulate office in San Antonio. The consulate officials um, gave that um, opportunity to Mr. Lozano. Apparently, they had been notified about the announcement that Mr. Lozano was going to make. And the announcement was that he was going to lead a campaign to raise the money to build schools in, in the cradle of Mexico's independence. This is full of symbolism, but also great astuteness. He's in, inserting himself into the politics of Mexico at a very important time. And he's doing it by participating in making Mexico whole again, with by making use of the longing by Mexicans. So he appealed this nationalist uh, longing for the welfare of Mexico at a point at which Mexico needed all the support that it could get in order to make Mexico whole again. So he issued this call and there was an immediate reaction. La Comisión Honorífica de Seguin, of Seguin, Texas, immediately this new organization donated $50. From that point on, people then began to send nickels and dimes and quarters and dollars to La Prensa offices. Mr. Lozano would then publish the names and the amounts of contributions, the contributions in the paper. This list appeared daily. Now, this is not a new thing that Mr. Lozano was doing. Mr. Lozano had led other efforts to help out the victims of uh, hurricanes in South Texas the victims of earthquakes in central Mexico, uh, the Christmas uh, 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 celebration they gave toys to poor children in San Antonio. So he was already involved in these civic affairs, including uh, uh, activities of a binational nature. They raised over $30,000. Uh, other monies came in from uh, Mexican sources like the uh, officials of Dolores Hidalgo, the town of Dolores Hidalgo, so that they exceeded $40,000. And they, they then hired an architect. Uh, could we see, um, uh, first of all, the announcement of the, um, the second image? You've got Lozano, now we, we have, need the second image of uh, announced the announcement that appeared in the newspaper. Here's a copy of the newspaper from 1921. And on the left columns, you'll see the announcement that uh, uh, the, the cornerstone is going to be laid. There's two major events that occur in Dolores Hidalgo. The first one occurs in 1921 when the cornerstone is being installed or placed. The second major celebration occurs in 1923 when the, when the schools are completed. The next image is an image of the design of the school. It's a very interesting design. Uh, 
um, resembling the, the schools of the time that were being built in the U.S. One of the things that is, uh, I've visited the place, by the way, the, the buildings are, are worn out and in need of major repair, but you can see the, the significance of the buildings. They're located in one entire block in the middle of the town of Dolores Hidalgo. One part of the school was for girls, named after uh, uh, Josefa Dominguez, a major figure in the independence movement of Mexico. On the other side, uh, the school is dedicated to, for the education of young boys, and it is named after uh, the priest Hidalgo, who led the independence movement in 1810. Uh, this, what's striking about these schools is that they're uh, more impressive in size and design and in, in, in the curriculum and in all kinds of other things than the schools in this country that Mexicans are attending. These poor Mexican parents feel very strongly about participating in the, re in the reconstruction of Mexico to the point that they're establishing schools in Mexico that their own children will not be able to attend in the U.S. Of course, the Mexican dignitaries, including Jose Vasconcelos, announced during the celebration of 1923 when the schools are completed that Mexicans in the U.S. are welcome to come to Mexico and attend these good schools with good teachers that are being established throughout Mexico, including Las Escuelas del Centenario. This is what they're called the schools of the centenary. In other words, 1923 is not only uh, two years after the end of the Mexican Revolution, they're commemorating that, but they're also commemorating the 100 years of independence that begins in 1821, and they're beginning to celebrate it in 1921. So the schools are named as, uh, given the, a, a commemorative name, uh, signifying Mexico's war for independence. Um, we have uh, another image um, um, laying the corner, cornerstone. Uh, Mr. Vasconcelos is laying a brick that is going to be underneath the cornerstone that is to his right. He's bending over and to his left and watching over his sh shoulder is Mr. Lozano. The people in the audience include Diego Rivera, major uh, political figures from Mexico City and the, the state of Guanajuato in central Mexico. It also includes uh, a delegation of uh, folks from Texas, mostly from California. It included Mrs. Elizondo Lozano, Alicia Elizondo Lozano, who was very uh, very important, uh, played an important part in this whole campaign, Mr. Lozano's uh, partner. And there are many other people here. The last uh, photograph that I wanted to share with you is a wonderful photograph that takes place in 1923. The ceremony for the opening of the schools occurs in 23, right in front of the girls portion of the school. And you cannot see, but under the portico uh, uh, above the stairs are all the dignitaries that include Jose Vasconcelos and Mr. Ignacio Lozano. And folks of all, of all stripes show up, including some uh, rancheros or ranch workers on horseback. It was a major uh, celebration that included dinners and speeches and and uh, kermeses in the local park. Uh, when you visit this school, you can read right to the right side of that entrance to the school, a plaque, a large plaque in which Mexican people are um, thanking Mexicans in the ex exterior for demonstrating interest and concern in the welfare of Mexico. This is an important instance of um, transnational relations between communities.
that occurs over and over again throughout the 20th century, and I think even now, and to the point that we can say that this campaign is representative of other instances in which communities, non-governmental organizations reach across the border and strengthen ties, elaborate ties. People are visiting their relatives. People from Mexico are coming and buying uh, materials to resell in the U.S. Uh, people uh, vacation, people of Mexican origin vacation in Mexico, people from Mexico vacation here. We watch in many instances the same novelas and the same TV programming and we also receive in our bedrooms news from Latin America and from the U.S. and Spanish. So, um, this, uh, this ends for now, uh, my presentation. I'll be happy to take questions from our chair. Uh, thank you very much for this opportunity. Thank you, uh, Dr. Samora. We'll, uh, we'll save the questions for the end and, uh, and move on to our, our next speaker, uh, Cecilia Bailly, who's a journalist and cultural anthropologist after beginning her journalism career at Brownsville Herald. At the San Antonio Express News, she became the first Latina writer of Texas Monthly, where she's been a writer at large since 2001. Her writing has also appeared in Harper's uh, Magazine, The New York Times, The Columbia Journalism Review, and multiple anthologies, including Best American Crime Writing. As an anthropologist, she was an assistant professor at the University of Texas at Austin and has conducted ethnographic research on Tejano identity, the sexual killing of women in Ciudad Juarez border wall and Latino voting and civic engagement. She is currently a visiting researcher at UT Austin Center for Mexican American Studies. Cecilia holds a BA from Stanford University and a PhD from Rice University. She lives in Houston. Dr. Bailly, which uh, will be our next speaker. Thank you, Dr. Romo. I appreciate the introduction. And uh, I also enjoyed Dr. Samora's talk. Emilio and I were colleagues uh, the six years I spent at UT Austin, and I deeply miss that community and people uh, like Emilio and, and getting to attend talks like his. So it was a real pleasure to hear your talk, Dr. Samora. I am going to be speaking um, more from my journalistic background. As Dr. Romo shared, I'm also a cultural anthropologist, and I've always worked on the border uh, through both of my professions and um, worked on the same subjects, but just used a little bit of a different lens as a journalist and as an anthropologist. Uh, but I began my um, journalism career, one would say, as a high school senior in Brownsville. My families on um, both my mother and father's side, uh, the Bayes and Hinojosas, have been in the border region since the 1700s, and uh, so I'm very, very rooted. It's where I come from. My parents were born on the Mexican side of the border in Matamoros, and then uh, crossed over to the U.S. side when they were adults. Uh, and they were migrant farm workers in California, but would always come back to Brownsville. And then we stopped migrating when I was five. So I grew up in Brownsville, very rooted uh, with a sense of a family story um, in the area. I wrote my first paper on Tejano history when I was a high school senior, a high school junior, and I started writing for the local paper. And so from the very beginning, I just developed a great interest in the border and its present realities and also its history and its culture. And uh, that year that I started writing for the Brownsville Herald as a senior, it was 1994. And that's the year that NAFTA came into, into fruition. Um, we'd already had industrialization programs on the border, but NAFTA would vastly transform the economies on both sides of the border. And so that's kind of a framework for the vast transformation of the border that I have been able to witness as a journalist, as an anthropologist, and that I'm speaking about today. Um, once I went off to college, I, I came to see the border as this great laboratory for understanding culture and history notions of race and nation that had been constructed very early on in the border region. And so I always kept going back to the border as both a journalist um, and the journalism allowed me to capture the immediacy and the change that was happening. 
But academia and, and specific, specifically history and anthropology allowed me to understand the context and have a deeper analysis. And so I always like to have those two disciplines sort of hand in hand or side by side. Um, in 2000, I started writing for Texas Monthly. And uh, as Dr. Romo mentioned, the magazine at that point was 27 years old and had never had um, any writers that were not white, any black or Latino or Latina writers. And it's a magazine that played a big role in constructing the story, the narrative of Texas and in, in defining what Texas is. Um, and so it was a unique opportunity to enter a place that um, captured sort of the Texan imagination, but be able to write about it from my perspective and be able to do a lot of border reporting for them. And uh, it also was a new kind of journalism for me that I really welcomed. It's a longer form journalism is what we call it. It allowed me to get into stories in depth and to use storytelling to uh, communicate those stories. It also allowed me to have a perspective and an argument in my stories, which newspaper reporting does not allow you to do as much. And so that's why I enjoyed it. it to me, it was a kind of a cross between the traditional journalism I'd practiced and uh, the way I had learned to think and write as an anthropologist. And I'm also able to use both first person and third person on the stories, depending on what I'm working on. And so this kind of flexibility is interesting and useful for me in writing about the border. I'm going to discuss in a bit some of the challenges of writing about the border and representing the border. But just a couple of analytical points to understand the context of the border. Um, I mean, obviously, we cannot even cover that in 20 minutes, as Dr. Samora said, like this, um, it's a very long history, it's a complex history. Uh, but some things I like to keep in mind is um, the border in South Texas specifically, where I've done a lot of my work, has experienced multiple waves of colonization from the Spanish families arriving to the Anglo families that, uh, the Spanish families, sorry, the displaced Native American communities um, and then Anglo families that came and displaced Tejano communities. And then the current uh, struggles to enforce and control the border on both sides in Mexico and the US. I consider all of this part of these ongoing waves of conquest and colonization that we, that we live through and that we write about as journalists. Also, I want to comment on the extreme inequality on both sides of the border. So the, the border is a very poor region. It's one of the poorest regions in the United States, consistently ranked as one of the poorest. On the Mexican side, you see a lot of poverty, but you also uh, have some of the most industrial advanced economies in the country. So compared to southern Mexico, the border economies in states like Tamaulipas and Chihuahua and, and Baja California are prosperous economies, but the wealth is very unevenly distributed. And so there are a few people on both sides of the border that can really benefit from that uh, commercialization of the border. And those are the land developers, those are the um, factory owners and people in industry. And then the rest of the communities are quite poor and disadvantaged. And a lot of them are immigrant communities, people who come to the border to work and consequently don't have um, family support and sort of those roots that they would have back home, the social cohesion that they would have back home. Another analytical point is that we are always trying to close and open the border at the same time. That's something that's unique about the U.S.-Mexico border. I think we see it in other world borders as well, but the U.S. is a board, the U.S.-Mexico border is a border that we have tried to intensely open since NAFTA and free trade, but we want to close it to all of the illicit economies that emerge next to uh, these licit economies. And um, anytime you build uh, infrastructure to facilitate legal economies to integrate, you're also creating the infrastructure that allows the movement of illicit goods. And so we have this conundrum on the border that we want to open it and we want to close it at the same time. And that creates a very interesting challenge for the US and Mexican governments. And the other last thing I want to mention, an analytical point is that we have always talked about this border in the language of war and through metaphors of war. And it's very hard to avoid that. You'll see as I proceed with my talk that even in my own reporting, I'm dealing with present day uh, language of war. Uh, but since the Mexican War, when the border was created in the 1840s, in 1846 to 1848, uh, we created an enemy 
you know, Mexico became an enemy and that Mex that enemy was also present internally in Texas, right, in the form of Mexican Americans. And this is something that Dr. Zamora has studied quite well and, and, and um, a very, very painful part of our racial history in Texas. But so the Mexican becomes the enemy and even Mexican Americans who are citizens in the U.S. become the enemy. Uh, so I think that that also informs to this day the way the rest of the country thinks about the border region, including those of us who are living in the United States as Latinos and as Latino immigrants. Um, and that language has continued very much through the period of border enforcement and this language of war. So I want to speak a bit about some of the reporting that I started doing that started focusing a lot on violence because I'm actually very enamored with the culture and history of the border. And I've tried to write about that for Texas Monthly. I've studied Tejano music um, and Tejano history. But in 2003, I worked on a story that would completely change the trajectory of my reporting for some time. And that is uh, Texas Monthly sent me to Ciudad Juarez to report on the women's killings, the, the serialized sexual killing of young poor women that had been happening for 10 years already at that time, at least 10 years in Juarez. Once I worked on a magazine story there, I felt like I had more questions than answers. And at the time I was pursuing my PhD in anthropology and decided to change the subject of my dissertation to the killings. And so I moved there the next year in January 2004 to do field work uh, in Juarez. I lived in El Paso, um, but that was the beginning of, um, at, at this point, maybe 17 years of reporting about violence on the border. Uh, at a year later, or rather the year that I moved to El Paso to do my dissertation field work, there was an editor killed in Nuevo Laredo, Tamaulipas. His name was Roberto Mora, and he was the editor of the newspaper El Mañana. I wrote about that for Texas Monthly while I was living in El Paso. I traveled over to Nuevo Laredo, and that opened up a window into a period of extreme violence that was about to emerge in Nuevo Laredo and Laredo. And that's sort of with the beginning of what we call the cartel wars. And I think cartels can be kind of a little bit more um, more misleading the term than helpful. But at the time, you know, we did have a concrete conflict between two groups, the Gulf Cartel and the Sinaloa Cartel in Nuevo Laredo. And that produced a new style of violence. Just like in Juarez, we had seen a new logic and a new style of violence against women. Um, and I consider that to be a product of sort of the new, the new logic of, of organized crime combined with the great impunity that exists, not just in Mexico. We like to think of the impunity as an issue with the Mexican government, but the border region is actually a place of great impunity. There's ironically, there are many police forces on both sides from ma many jurisdictional levels, local, state, national police flooding the border. But it's a, a, board, it's a zone that's very permeable and a lot of kind of impunity, if you will, happens in the spaces between all of these law enforcement presence and the great power and presence of the global economy. And so you've created all these spaces where these forms of violence occur that are hard to police and that are hard to control. And so um, I started reporting in both areas and uh, I covered sort of the, what I'm calling the two border wars of our time. Um, I like to think of sort of this enforcement that was happening on both sides of the border. We mostly for a while paid attention to what was happening on the Mexican side because of the, the nature of the violence, which was very graphic, very public, very spectacular. Uh, organized crime was now engaging in these tactics of trying to terrorize communities. And so they took their violence pro uh, public. It's not that the violence was not there before, but they started using it as a form of communication and intimidation. And for a long time, our reporting as journalists focused on that, on the body count, on the, on the beheadings. Um, and we didn't pay as much attention for a while on this more silent war that was happening on this side of the border as we ramped up our border enforcement strategies. And so we had had a new approach to border enforcement since the 1990s under uh, President Bill Clinton that tried to deter migration by controlling, intensely controlling certain parts of the border in hopes that migrants would 
shift over to areas of the border that were harder to cross and they would not cross. The idea was they will not cross to the mountains. They will not cross to these areas that are more dangerous. Of course, now we know that didn't happen. Determent didn't happen. Uh, people continued to cross and we started seeing an increasing number of people who died trying to cross the border. In 2006, uh, 2006 ends up being a pivotal year as far as these wars. And again, I hate to um, feed the metaphor but it's the language literally that both countries have been using. So uh, in 2006, we had President George Bush, uh, George W. Bush signed the Secure Fence Act, which was an act of Congress that allowed for the building of 700 miles of fencing. At the time we called it border fence, and now we just outright call it a border wall. Uh, he was trying to pass um, comprehensive immigration reform. Democrats and Republicans were collaborating like they hadn't done before, trying to pass immigration reform, but the only thing that ended up being palatable to the public for political purposes was the wall, the fence. And so that's the only part of the, of the package that actually made it through. And Republicans had a big public uh, signing ceremony in order to be able to claim credit over what they were doing to control the border. And so I ended up doing a long uh, immersive project, ethnographic project on the building of the wall in South Texas. And I'll show some images in a bit. That same year, President Felipe Calderón in Mexico was elected into office. And as I mentioned, sort of this, this drug related violence started escalating significantly in his home state of Michoacán, in Tamaulipas, in Chihuahua. And he felt like he had to do something to send a message as soon as he stepped into office that he was going to be able to bring this violence under control. And he decided to do it by using the Mexican army, the troops, right? And so it's, it's referred to in Mexico as La Guerra de Calderón. He donned a military uniform. He sent thousands of troops to Michoacán first and eventually to Ciudad Juarez. In 2008, he sent um, eventually close to 10,000 uh, army soldiers and federal police. During that period that the army was present in Juarez, in the name of fighting the cartels, the violence exploded. The number of killings went up exponentially and Juarez became what, what the media called the murder capital of the world. And so I became interested in why those two things happened concurrently. The army was there to control the violence and instead violence had skyrocketed. And so I worked for a couple of years on a piece for Harper's Magazine where I um, ended up exploring the pattern between the military's presence and its increasing um, human rights violations. They would kidnap poor young men from neighborhoods and torture them for, disappear them and torture them for days just to find out who sells drugs on your street. They were gathering intelligence at a very surface level, not from people involved in, deeply involved in organized crime. And so they also um, actually ended up producing or feeding more violence because the local police became inactive. They were also uh, pursued by the military. And so we have these two wars happening at the same time. The building of the border wall, which continues today, and the war against the Mexican cartels, which even though um, we've had a couple of pre Mexican presidents since then, the logic continues even uh, today under President Andres Manuel Lopez Obrador. We still have uh, police, now national police, um, out on the streets in Mexico. And so I, as I reflect on the challenges of reporting on the border, I want to show you, just take you through some photos, some slides that um, just will bring a little bit more, um, bring to life sort of some of these areas where I've been working. Some of the things that I've been seeing on the ground as a journalist the past uh, 20 years. So, So some of the challenges of reporting on the border. One of the big ones for me as a writer is how to capture the, the multiple realities of the border. The border is a place where there is extreme beauty, extreme cultural richness, extreme humanity, um, you know, beautiful forms of music. Um, and it's also a place of extreme suffering. And I find it very hard as a writer as, a, as specifically as a journalist, 
to capture these two sides of the border in one story. Typically, editors want one or the other. They want the story on Ramon Ayala, Norteño, Accordion King, or they want the story on you know, drug violence and people dying. And it's hard to integrate those two perspectives into a single journalistic story. This photo here is of student protests in Juarez when the, when the violence was up. Another challenge is how to avoid feeding into those popular narratives and tropes that have always framed the way we understand the border. Um, so it's very, very hard, even at Texas Monthly, when I would uh, write a story and try to be very mindful to not feed those tropes, those narratives. Um, the headlines and the art that the editors gave to my story would perpetuate those tropes and those narratives. Another challenge, uh, this here is an interesting image. It's the border fence in Brownsville. It's the fence is on, all on U.S. soil. And so this is one property that got bisected by the fence and the owner is grazing, um, you know, the, his horse on the other, the opposite side. Another challenge is getting editors interested in stories, a variety of stories. So, as, you know, it's very hard uh, to get them interested in stories other than drugs or immigration. So the story in Mexico is drugs and the story on the U.S. side is immigration. And we do have an unprecedented amount of attention on the border. Uh, before it was impossible to get an editor at a national publication in New York to be interested in a border story. These days they are interested, but it's um, very hard to, to get them to want other stories beyond the usual. Uh, another challenge is that there is an increasing difficulty in capture, in accessing information on both sides of the border. And this is on the U.S. side of the border, as you know, there's a, since the creation of the Department of Homeland Security in 2002, um, all of the local operations of the federal agencies were centralized and controlled out of Washington. It's much harder as a journalist now to call a local chief of the DEA and have him talk to you. Uh, they always have to run everything by Washington. Um, on the Mexican side of the border, obviously, it's increasingly harder to get information because of safety reasons and because people are not willing to talk, even in government, are not willing to talk on issues that have to do with organized crime. Um, there's also a real need for uh, cross-border collaboration among journalists. Um, we don't work across the border, unfortunately. And, you know, there's ways in which Mexican reporters can access information on the Mexican side that we need. And we can access information here that they need. And unfortunately, we don't have the relationships um, set up, um, the institutions that are supporting cross-border journalism. Uh, and, and it was interesting to hear Dr. Samora's talk about how back then there, I would say there was more of an international um, framework for journalism than there is today. Uh, the other challenge, obviously, is safety and well-being. And I mean both physical safety, but also mental uh, well-being and health. You know, reporting on these issues takes a real toll. And typically journalists did not talk about this, but we've all felt it. We've all felt the load of this. We have all been dealing with the long-term effects of doing this work over a period of time. And if I may say, it also takes a toll on your soul, on your heart, especially if you're from this area. And it's very painful to see your own home region being transformed and being subject to so much violence and feeling so impotent to change that, including the, the media narratives. To be a journalist and to, to see the, the holes in the narratives and only be able to do very little through your own writing is, is a frustrating feeling. I want to conclude my talk by saying that I titled it Writing and Rewriting the Border because the border is a place that you never are done understanding it. You're never done telling its stories because it's so complex and it's always changing. I think Dr. Samora can probably relate to this from the standpoint of historians and the, the new efforts to reinterpret uh, the history of the border from a borderlands perspective. Um, but the other thing as a journalist is that we are always writing about the border for new audiences. It seems like every time you know, we a, a state publication wants a story, a national publication wants a story. 
we're having to explain the border all over again to a new person that wants to feel like they're discovering the border. And so the border always has to be rediscovered. It always has to be rewritten. And the challenges in that is that we tend to use these explanatory frameworks and voices to, to do that storytelling. And that can lead to some very totalizing and reductive narratives. It's like we're always having to go back to square one and explain the history and the context of the border very quickly in every story. I think those narratives can also be very dangerous. Um, I want to make a direct relationship between the massacre that happened in El Paso last year, almost exactly a year ago, um, August 3rd, 2019, when 21 year old Patrick uh, Crucius uh, went into a Walmart, drove there from a Dallas suburb, and he um, killed 23 people and injured 23 people. The most violent, uh, most uh, deadly attack Latino on Latinos in modern history. And many people blame um, the rhetoric coming from Washington, specifically from President Trump, this idea of invasions of Mexicans and Central Americans that was actually quoted uh, word for word in um, Patrick Crucius's manifesto, where he repeated those narratives about um, this country being invaded uh, and the need to preserve um, and protect Americans. And I think, you know, that's, we finally saw a kind of more bloody expression of that, of those ongoing wars on the US side. It was easier before to think of the, the blood and the gore happening on the Mexican side. You know, it, it came directly into our communities. It had always been there, but in a more silent way. And so I think the Walmart event is, is a very, very important um, sort of uh, moment that, that brings into articulation the, the cost of these long-term stories and narratives about the border. Um, my own challenge also as a journalist is how to take advantage of uh, the journalists, the, the, the media interests on the border these days, like be able to use that so that I can place stories in state and national publications. And yet, how to use those stories to show you a little bit of a different angle or a different take on the border. Um, that's a, an ongoing challenge as a writer. Uh, I just went down to the valley, uh, the Rio Grande Valley, because an um, aunt of mine unfortunately passed away from COVID. And I'm thinking of writing a story about how the valley is exploding with COVID cases because there's a lot of spread. One of the reasons, not the only reason there's a lot of spread among families, but extended family and uh, deep social bonds in the valley are also would have allowed people to survive poverty and disadvantage for a long time. So how can we tell that story, the COVID story that national and state editors are interested in, but show you the border from our own perspective? So in closing, I just uh, want to say, you know, um, that will keep rewriting the border. I never moved away from that subject. You know, as a journalist, you think you're going to start focused on something and eventually write about many different things. Here I am uh, 25 years after I started writing about the border and I'm still writing on it. But hopefully every time that we rewrite these stories and these narratives, we are doing it more and more in our own voices. And I think this is also happening in Borderlands history where um, Mexican Americans are getting to participate in the telling of that history and the interpretation of that history. The same is happening in journalism. I think, um, you know, slowly uh, there are more Latino voices in media and we get to be part of the conversation and hopefully shape those narratives so that they are richer and more true to our experience of our home region. So, thank you. Thank you, thank you Dr. Bailey. Uh, I'm going, we only have uh, time for one question to each one of you. So I'll begin with Dr. Zamora and it'll be like a two part question. Number one is what? Uh, and sort of got interested as to did he just pick Dolores Hidalgo for the symbolism and that he had or was he connected anyway uh, from that area? Um, I think it was it had to do more with the symbolism. And I think the decision to go there was made at that meeting, early meeting with the president uh, elect and the new president, along with Vasconcelos in Mexico City. He we don't know. All we know is that he announced the campaign soon after coming back 
And, and I think they, they, they were looking for uh, symbolic value in much of what they were doing in order to uh, encourage as many people as possible to join this campaign to renovate Mexico, reconstruct Mexico. So I, th I think it was, um, it, the decision was made in consultation with the leadership in Mexico City. It was a good choice, and, and, and I commend you. Uh, I don't, this is totally unprecedented that anybody had that much of an impact to actually build schools in another community in Mexico. Uh, unprecedented for when he did it, and likely unprecedented since. I don't know that anybody has been able to do that. We, we can calculate that $30,000 could be well be 300000 or $3 million. I don't, I'll, I'll get an economist to help with that. Thank you for your presentation. Excellent. Uh, Dr. Bailly, um, I, there's so much that you're doing, so uh, I have all kinds of questions, including about a chapel. But my main question is, are you going to put all these essays together in some way or another into a book anthology so the our generation and others down the line can see everything that you've covered is, is so, in, so rich and really would um, like to know if you're going thinking about that or have you done it? I have not done it, unfortunately, and I, I have not written books either on what is or the border enforcement work I've done, but uh, thank you for the suggestion. It's something that I would like to do. I think I'm in a place now where I'm reflecting a lot more on a long trajectory and what it all added up to and what it means, and so this might be a good time to pursue that. I appreciate it, and I know I went over my time a bit. I apologize. Uh, it's it's a lot of material to, to have, cover. Have, try to have, <laughs> many, many, many stories, and uh, uh, both of you all are greatly enrich our, our, our knowledge here. So thank you, and we will be ending this session uh, pretty much on time. But thank you both for great presentations. Thank you. Thank you.